The Northumberland Manuscript Bacon and Shakespeare Manuscripts in One Portfolio In 1867, in Northumberland House, a manuscript folder was discovered, which at one time had been in Francis Bacon's possession. The folder listed some of Bacon's well-known works, along with two of the Shakespeare plays, Richard the Second and Richard the Third. It is the only Elizabethan document that has both the names Shakespeare and Francis Bacon written together. The Northumberland manuscript is a valuable contemporary document which, although somewhat damaged by a fire in old Northumberland house, survives to prove that Shakespeare's manuscripts of Richard II and Richard III were once tied up in a portfolio with Francis Bacon's Conference of Pleasure. Here are some of the notes on the original list of contents and the jottings on the cover. Revealing day through every cranny peeps. This is practically a line from The Rape of Lucrece, the only difference being that the word spies is used in the play instead of peeps. The name Shakespeare or William Shakespeare, and the name Bacon, or Francis Bacon, had been written upon the page several times. This association of the names and their conjunction on the title page of a collection of manuscripts must be of interest. It should be remembered that no trace of an original manuscript of any play or poem ascribed to Shakespeare of Stratford has ever been discovered. The Northumberland manuscript is not in Bacon's handwriting, but neither is it in the Stratfordians. Please keep in mind, Francis and Anthony Bacon owned a writing workshop, and people employed there would have been proficient in their writing skills. From London Evening Standard, July 30th, 1992. Handwriting expert Maureen Gandhi has added weight to claims that the Elizabethan author and philosopher Francis Bacon wrote the plays attributed to Shakespeare. She claims it is highly probable that Bacon was the author of a recently discovered Elizabethan manuscript describing a scene which bears a striking similarity to one from Henry IV. She compared a copy of the handwritten document, thought to date back to the 1590s, when Henry IV was written and published, with the handwriting of 30 well-known scholars and statesmen of the Elizabethan era. Mrs Ward Gandy, who outlined her findings in a 20-page report, is a forensic document examiner, a job which often involves studying handwriting for the police and home office to establish fraud. She said, The shapes of the letters and style of writing in the Elizabethan document point to the writing being that of Bacon. The scene in the document describes a conversation in which an innkeeper tells two thieves of a man that lodged in our house last night that hath three hundred marks in gold. Similar conversations, in an almost identical setting, are described in Henry IV. In 1901, Robert Theobald wrote, If Bacon wrote Shakespeare, the promise is intelligible. If he did not, it is an insoluble riddle. Francis Bacon's promise is by itself sufficient evidence to show that the man who wrote the promise also wrote the Shakespeare plays. Bacon kept a private memorandum of books which he called the promise of formularies and elegancies, which from time to time he jotted down any words, similes, phrases, proverbs or colloquialisms which he thought might come in useful in connection with his literary work. 
The word promus means storehouse. Bacon's promus contains nearly 2,000 entries in various languages. English, Greek, Latin, Italian, Spanish and French. The promus, which is in Bacon's own handwriting, fortunately was preserved. It is now in the Harleian collection at the British Museum. It was reproduced and published for the first time in 1883. No one knows the exact date when Bacon commenced his collection, but the years 1594 and 1596 are written against some of the notations. The Promise was a collection of private notebooks. It was unknown to the public for a period of more than 200 years. It is a significant fact that Bacon, in works published under his own name, makes very little use of the notes in the promise. So what was the purpose of keeping this collection of phrases, etc.? The answer is, they were used in his dramatic works, published under the pseudonym William Shakespeare. A great number of the promise entries are reproduced in the Shakespeare plays, some even word for word. Stratfordians try to get over this fact by contending that these expressions were in common use at the time. But why would a writer waste his time making a special note of anything that was in common usage? Many words and expressions in the promise frequently occur in the Shakespeare plays. Yet it is highly improbable an actor named William Shakespeare would have been given permission to access Sir Francis Bacon's private notebooks. A most important piece of evidence in the promise is the word Albada, A-L-B-A-D-A, dated 1594-96 to and is Spanish for good dawning. It is known Bacon spoke Spanish. This expression, good dawning, only appears once in English print, namely in the play King Lear, first printed in 1608, Act 2, Scene 2. Good dawning to thee, friend. Bacon's promise collection contains many such salutations. Good morrow, good soir, good matin, bonjour, good day. These notes were made in the promise in 1596. It is a remarkable coincidence that in the following year, 1597, when the play Romeo and Juliet was published, it contained several of these greetings. Afterwards, they appeared in other Shakespeare plays, Good Morrow being used 115 times, Good Day 15 times, and good soir, twelve times. These salutations are unique. They are found only in Bacon's promise, plus the Shakespeare plays, nowhere else in English literature. William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon Within Holy Trinity Church, Stratford-upon-Avon, at the time the 1623 Shakespeare folio was being published. A mysterious monument featuring a bust of Shakespeare was erected. No one knows who arranged for its construction or who paid for it. Another peculiarity about the monument was that this bust of Shakespeare bore no resemblance to the Drochout portrait which adorned the 1623 folio. Moreover, there was nothing about the image suggesting that it had any connection to literature. Instead, the bust depicted a rustic-looking man with a stern face and a drooping moustache, clutching a sack of grain. A fitting representation, considering Shakespeare from Stratford, was known to have been a grain merchant in later years. The reason we know about the original bust 
is due to an engraving which appeared in Sir William Dugdale's Book of Warwickshire, published in 1656. In 1748, after a century of neglect, the original grain merchant bust was replaced by that of a completely different looking individual, and so it remains to the present day. Alfred Dodd offers this description. The effigy which stands in place of the curious original are in general outline the same, but a cushion takes the place of the bag and a large quill pen is placed in his hand. His hands no longer suggest that he hugs his grain or woolsack, and the smirking doll-like face, very different from the original. The Myth Maker. In 1769, the celebrated London actor David Garrick travelled to Stratford to pay homage to a man he erroneously thought based on the wording in the folio, to have authored the Shakespearean work. Upon his arrival, Garrick found the Stratford citizens to be profoundly oblivious as to who Shakespeare was. The village was ravaged by filth and decay. All vestiges of the mud wall houses in which the Shakespeare family allegedly dwelled were long gone. But Garrick the actor became Garrick the entrepreneur. He saw an opportunity to turn Stratford and Shakespeare into a profitable enterprise. Thus Garrick, wittingly or unwittingly, cashed in on the nebulous legacy of the 1623 folio. And the Stratfordian myth of the man the world came to know as the great greatest writer of the English language was born. Almost instantaneously, Garrick began to use his celebrity to attract outside visitors, with money to spend, to his Stratford Jubilees. He produced and starred in virtually all of the Shakespearean plays. Other profitable Jubilee attractions included guided tours of Shakespeare's alleged birthplace, and souvenirs of furniture and other miscellaneous items, supposedly once owned by Shakespeare, were for sale. Shakespeare of Stratford had become a cottage industry. But more importantly, as the popularity of the Shakespearean work increased, the Stratford myth of Shakespeare gradually worked its way into the hallowed halls of orthodox history. Eventually, biographical books about the life of this man named Shakespeare began to materialise, using sheer invention and supposition, truth buried by presumptive extrapolation. Author Ross Jackson states, Many books were written about Will Shakespeare. An uncritical and unquestioning public consumed them with great interest. What the public did not notice was that these books invariably started out with the unstated but tenuous assumption that the man from Stratford consisted mainly of speculations about how he must have done that, how he must have travelled there, how he must have known this person, how he must have been proficient in this language and how he must have been the greatest genius in literature that ever lived. Yet there's little or no evidence to back up the assertions. Amazingly, by the onset of the 19th century, the Stratfordian version of William Shakespeare, the author, was generally adopted as gospel among historical and literary academics. By the mid-19th century, many prominent writers and scholars had begun to scrutinise the Stratfordian doctrine they discovered glaring holes and inconsistency in the traditional story. The Shakespeare Problem In order to create the Shakespearean works, the author had to meet certain criteria. First and most important is that he was a genius of the highest magnitude. 
he had to have had an education that far exceeded any ordinary university graduate. He was a master linguist, fluent in Latin, Greek, Italian, Spanish and French. He possessed a mastery of all classical literature, which included Homer, Ovid, Virgil, Cicero, Seneca, Plutarch, Tacitus, etc. He also had a superior knowledge of philosophy and science. He was a well-trained lawyer, possessing a highly sophisticated knowledge and understanding of the finer points of law. He was familiar with and accustomed to the manners and protocol of royal courts, both in England and France. He travelled abroad to many different foreign countries. He had knowledge of various sports enjoyed only by the noble class, most notably falconry. And finally, he was both a Rosicrucian and a Freemason. The author of the greatest works in English literature displays proficiency in all the above requirements. However, there is not a shred of evidence that Shakespeare of Stratford ever received an education, or that he ever owned a book, or that he ever wrote a letter, or that he ever travelled abroad. The acquired knowledge needed to write the great works is not proven. As far as the record shows, there are only six alleged instances in which he awkwardly scrawled a barely legible signature on various documents throughout his life. Each of the signatures suggests he was remarkably unskilled with a pen. Note that the Stratford man was not known as Shakespeare, nor did he ever write his name as such. In the six instances that he wrote his name, he invariably writes Shakespeare. His last will and testament makes no mention of books, manuscripts, notes, letters or anything of a literary nature. Many of today's academic community have heavily invested in the Stratfordian myth where there is a great deal of money and prestige to be had. Stratford-upon-Avon's visitor spending for this year, 2015, is said to be in excess of £428 million. Hence, any investigation into the traditional view of Shakespeare meets with unjustified name-calling and fierce fanatical resistance. This response is despite hard evidence and a timeline confirming Sir Francis Bacon as the only historical figure who matches all criteria required for Shakespeare's authorship. Character, assassination and disinformation. In 1837, Thomas Babington Macaulay, an English writer and politician, wrote a false and libelous essay about Francis Bacon. Macaulay, later Lord Macaulay, was a flamboyant, forceful writer whose speciality was sensationalised history. In other words, he was a hack writer with little concern about getting his facts straight. Macaulay vilified Bacon in every conceivable way. Unfortunately, Many uninformed people blindly accepted Macaulay's lies as history. Stratfordians will shamelessly cite Macaulay as a historical source on Sir Francis Bacon, despite the fact that Oxford University ordered all of Macaulay's works to be placed in a special category as not trustworthy to history. Winston Churchill referred to Macaulay as the prince of literary rogues who always preferred the tale to the truth. Ironically, near the end of his life, Macaulay said he regretted having written his disparaging essay on Bacon. Bacon the Concealed Poet 
The poet Gerald Massey noted the philosophical writings of Bacon are suffused and saturated with Shakespeare's thought. The poet and essayist Alexander Smith wrote, He, Bacon, seems to have written his essays with the pen of Shakespeare. While the essayist and historian Thomas Carlyle proclaimed, There is an understanding manifested in the construction of Shakespeare's plays, equal to that in Bacon's writing, Novum Organum. Toby Matthew, Bacon's secretary, wrote his master a letter in which he states about Bacon. The most prodigious wit that ever I knew, though he is known by another name. Years later, John Aubrey described Bacon as a good poet, but concealed. Great poets always recognise the genius of other great poets even when they are concealed. With regard to Bacon, Percy Shelley said, Lord Bacon was a poet. His language has a sweet and majestic rhythm which satisfies the senses, no less than the almost superhuman wisdom of his philosophy satisfies the intellect. Letting Percy Shelley have the last word, I have now finished this presentation.